Welcome back to DC Thursdays. I'm Pete Soderling. I'm the founder of Data Council and the Data Community Fund. And I'm happy to have another amazing guest. Uh, on the show, as you know, we interview the leaders of the modern data ecosystem, um, either creators of open source tools, interesting data projects, or founders of data companies. And I'm really excited to have Tristan Zients here today. Uh, he's from Continual IQ. Um, Kristen has, Tristan has some uh, really interesting thoughts on AI and the modern data stack. And he and I have been having conversations about sort of what's missing in the modern cloud data stack. And um, today we'll be talking about MLOps in perhaps a way that you haven't thought of before. Um, and we'll also hear some of Tristan's thoughts on declarative AI. So uh, Tristan is currently the founder of a company called Continual IQ. Formerly, he was the CTO for machine learning at Cloudera. And previously, uh, he was the co-founder of a company called Sense, which was an early company in the data science tooling space. Uh, before that, he was a visiting fellow at the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard. So Tristan, with that, I wanna welcome you to the show. Thanks, Pete, I appreciate that. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make one small correction, which is the name of the startup is now Continual. We actually, we actually, when we were just incorporating, we called it Continual IQ because we couldn't get a domain name for Continual, uh, but we managed to shorten it down. So Continual, uh, Continual AI, if anybody wants to check it out. That's right. Thanks, so now it's thanks for it's, thanks for having thanks for having me. The the site is Continual.ai now. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Awesome. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, it, it's really a pleasure to have you, and we've known each other for a couple of years now, mm -hmm. and. Um, it's been great to see sort of your, your quiet work behind the scenes at Continual, um, but I'm hoping that maybe you'll be able to share a little bit more about, about some of that with us today. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's excited to be here. Thanks for having me. So um, I just want to start at the beginning and comment that your PhD is in public policy. <laughs> um, so how, how does this translate into uh, running or starting a data science tooling company? Yeah, no, I get that question a lot. I've actually on LinkedIn, I think I just removed my, uh, you know, a link to my dissertation or something because I was like, okay, I have enough, uh, enough experience here now in the enterprise uh, data science and machine learning space that I don't need to don't need to talk about my, my sort of my earlier life. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it's, uh, it's actually, I mean, it's a common, well, I, I guess I can, uh, you know, go back, you know, way back, um, you know, I'm old enough now, uh, sort of embarrassingly to have participated in really the dot com one uh, experience. So I graduated high school in 1998, um, which was really when that whole internet was taking off. Um, I had taken CS classes in, you know, even in high school, uh, I was I knew how to build software in college, I actually did a few startups like small startups, including some that actually were successful, maybe even more successful uh, than uh, my previous startup that would that got acquired. Uh, you know, it was one of the fastest growing sites on did one was one of the fastest growing sites on the internet you know, thousands of users signing up per day, which was actually an amazing thing back then. <laughs> um, and so, so always have been somebody who's been sort of tracking technology, know how to build software, you know, like building stuff, kind of have an entrepreneurial uh, bent. Um, then ended up, you know, as, you, as you're pointing out, kind of ended up spending my, uh, my 20s in, in academia and, and sort of, uh, uh, you know, applying, I mean, in academia, I ended up doing a lot of work on data, um, data science, I guess what you'd call it now data science, my dissertation was all on Bayesian statistics and causal inference. Um, it was in the public pu public policy domain, but I was always the person sort of building the software, doing the data analysis. Uh, yeah, you know, and even my research ended up being really around econometrics, which is the sort of statistics within the economic discipline. That's what they call it. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit, you know, and then I think that early uh, uh, taste of entrepreneurship and success and building something and putting it out and having it go viral and, and be successful was always there in the back of my mind. And so throughout grad school, I was always thinking of, uh, you know, business mm. ideas, thinking of things to build, you know, uh, and uh, ultimately it was, you know, coming out of grad school, the decision was, you know, do become a professor uh, or do a startup and, you know, ended up, uh, you know, couldn't resist the adventure really of, of, of doing startups and building things and mm -hmm. you know, trying to trying to make things that are in your mind a reality, which there's an element of that, I think, in academia. I mean, part of the appeal of academia as well is the ability to kind of think creativity, you know, creatively about about the future and, you know, things that might not be obvious to everybody. Um, and uh, that's part of academia, which is, uh, you know, definitely, a, you know, I still find that appealing. But there's a there's another version of that in, in the startup world, which 
is very similar actually intellectually, but has this power of, uh, you know, you actually can make it real and take it to the next mm -hmm. step and, and, and kind of deliver it into the world versus just, you know, writing up a paper and publishing it and kind of, you know, crossing your fingers that some other, other person operationalizes it. Or yeah, the, 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 the direct access to that impact is definitely exciting. Um, yeah. So you, en you ended up starting this company basically in the early days of data science tooling um, essentially, this is the first called, startup. Yeah, the, yeah, called, okay. called, Sen okay. called Sense that you that you sold to uh, ultimately sold to Cloudera. Um, tell us the story about Sense and how that company came to be. Yeah, so um, was coming out of grad school. This was around 2012, 2013 when that when, when that company was uh, was sort of being born, um, and really was seeing the rise of data science as a term. So the rise of data science as a term, the rise of this emerging class of user called a data scientist. Um, the rise of open source data science tools. Uh, so things like Python and R uh, becoming increasingly the dominant tool that uh, you know, anybody doing data analysis wanted to use. That's contrasted with you know, the historical tools that even I was using in grad school, things like uh, Stata and SPSS and SAS and MATLAB, right? These are sort of proprietary statistical computing uh, tools, but that was clearly not where the future was, was going. There was also at that time the rise of big data, right? So the rise of the Hadoop ecosystem, the rise of Spark, uh, um, and and then a, a kind of a, a background parallel trend was just the movement to the cloud, right? The, just the reality that we're going to move away from our laptops towards the cloud. We're going to do things at scale, um, and so that sort of created. You know, I could just smell that. Wow, there needs to be a new approach to doing data, data, uh, well, statistical analysis, data science. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a platform for data scientists. And so what sense was was really a, a, the, one of the first, really one of the first enterprise data science platforms. It was, you know, there's three small startups at the time um, that were that probably, we were all right in the, in the, at the same moment, trying to mm -hmm. realize this, this uh, vision. Um, and, uh, you know, it ended up kind of gelling together um, uh, in terms of what that meant, you know, giving a collaboration environment for data scientists, you know, starting to help them uh, be able to uh, operationalize or productionize things, schedule their jobs, you know, but this is all sort of code first, um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, classic. And now there's a whole nother generation, right? Now the, the public clouds have adopted, you know, we have SageMaker, we have Vertex AI, we have Azure ML, uh, we have Databricks, of course, which is, you know, mm -hmm. has done a tremendous job, particularly powered by that underlying data platform of, of uh, you know, that, that they get from Spark and, you know, the whole ecosystem that mm -hmm. they've developed there. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that was, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I can go I can go much, much deeper in. I mean, we, we uh, you know, we, we, we were small. We were, you know, we basically were seed funded. We got the you know, initial product market fit. It became a category. It also became clear that, hey, where this is an enterprise, uh, uh, one, this is sort of an enterprise software game, right? Ultimately, the, the, the people that are going to pay for this are within the enterprise. Um, and so that entails a whole bunch of, you know, how it's deployed is still at that point, you know, cloud was still a challenge, um, to, especially within large enterprise. So we were getting a lot of pull to go on prem. Um, and of course there was also a sort of a, 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 we could see a trend that it would be very powerful to attach this, uh, uh, experience to the underlying, an underlying data platform, an underlying platform. So, mm. you know, Databricks has that with their kind of core platform. The public clouds have that obviously with their, uh, hyperscale platforms and Cloudera, uh, had a data platform really we, was the leading provider of Hadoop, you know, was the dominant, uh, at scale data platform, particularly on-prem. Um, recognized that machine learning and AI were the most exciting, were kind of the ultimate uh, workload uh, for data, right? That's sort of the top of the value pyramid. Um, and data scientists were the, a type of user that they really needed to bring to the platform. Hadoop was traditionally quite more, more engineering, kind of Java oriented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, you know, it was clear that they, you know, wanted to get it, you know, wanted to get into this area. And, um, you know, we were just kind of at the right time, right level of maturity for them. And, and we, so they ended up making an offer and, and joined them. And that product sense became their data science workbench product. Now data it's science Cloudera. workbench. Yeah, got it. Yeah, now it's. I think they have a they have a cloud version of it called Cloudera uh, Machine Learning, but was very successful for them. I mean, the, the general strategy of you know making that that data platform easier, bringing more workloads onto it, enabling data scientists. Um, you know, uh, it was a kind of a compelling value proposition for sure. So then, is is your sense that Cloudera wanted to compete? With Data Robot, who's also in the same category, um, or or that it was a value, more of a value add. The Data Science Workbench was more of a value add for the overall Cloudera platform. 
So I wouldn't put a, you know, data robot, I would, you know, which is the kind of auto ML focused company um, that was also actually started actually kind of parallel, but wasn't really the, the code first platform that was targeting data scientists, right? That was giving you Python as the kind of mm. core mm. ingredient of your workflow. Um, so I don't think there was a, there was never a desire at Clutter to compete with a, a data robot. I think there was a recognition um, that uh, you did need to bring data scientists onto your platform because data mm. science workloads were critical that data scientists wanted to use languages like, you know, Python as, as their kind of core language. Um, they wanted to use, you know, in the big data ecosystem, they also wanted to use Spark. So, uh, you know, and then uh, they, so they won't main, mainly wanted to stay, you know, bring those new users on, bring those workloads on. And they could also see obviously the rise of, of Databricks, uh, you know, which, you know, has a, you know, took Spark and then put a note, the first thing they did was put a notebook, <laughs> you know, based uh, experience on top of that, right? Um, to, to make it easier uh, for people to, to use what would otherwise be con a complicated technology. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it. yeah, it was really about that emerging class of use cases. Got it. Um, and so like, how, how was the rest, of, just so we can sort of understand the rest of the context at this, at this point in time, um, how, how do you see the rest of the competition in the market shaping up sort of around sense slash data science workbench at the time? Like who were those competitors? Um, you mentioned a couple mm. of startups that, that you competed with when you first started the company. I'm just curious how that um, world emerged because sometimes we get lessons from, um, you know, how things might sort of um, run in parallel later on. Yeah, no, and I'm not sure that all the new startups doing ML ops and, and notebooks and all are aware of the fact that this sort of, I think this trend really started with in, in the 2012, 2013 era. Um, so prior to 2012, 2013, um, you know, there was basically lap, you know, there was Jupyter Notebook on your own laptop, right? Uh, so that was the, that was the open source Python kind of, here's a notebook for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an open source, but the dominant, I mean, the dominant tool within the enterprise was SAS, SAS, right? Which mm -hmm. is this, you know, nobody even talks about anymore, but has $3 billion in revenue. I think it's, mm -hmm. I just heard that they might be getting it. They're privately held. They're, you know, kind of an idiosyncratic company, but they have their birth in the, 70s, 70s actually, then became the dominant statistical platform in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, but they had all the things that enterprises needed, right? They had the support, the scheduling, the connectivity to the underlying data platform. And so they had, you know, SaaS was the one company that really managed to do advanced, you know, advanced analytics, right? Statistics, what they would call then uh, in an enterprise way, right? And they had a core platform and then they started to have modules, you know, supply chain optimization or hotel management, price optimization, or you know, marketing and sales. Um, so they were the company that had managed to move to the enterprise, managed to generate you know, bill, billions of dollars in revenue. Um, and and that was, there, were, there were also <clears throat> a handful of these you know, SPSS and you know, for that IBM bought and Stata, which is in, big mm. in the economics world. You know, R was big in the statistical community, but you know, for the research community. In fact, R was more dominant from a research perspective than Python because Python really didn't have the the data frame ecosystem. So that's where mm -hmm. the, that, that, that was the 2000 era, you know, 2012 era. There was in parallel to that, then the rise, two parallel rises, one, the rise of Python uh, as, as, as the kind of really the, 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 the language for machine learning uh, and the rise of the big data ecosystem, you know, Spark being a big part of that, Hadoop being a big part of that. Um, and I think that sort of changed the game. So so it were provided an opportunity that clearly these previous companies weren't gonna be the ones that were gonna win. And so then a new class of startups came out. We were one of them. Uh, Domino Data Labs was another one, which was mm -hmm. you know, very similar to what we were doing. There was mm -hmm. another company called Y Hat at the time that got acquired mm -hmm. by Alteryx uh, that was very similar. And Databricks to Databricks' credit was you know, also in that era, but they had, uh, you know, I think the secret sauce of, of Spark, um, which really gave them the scale around compute mm. data um, and so they're, you know, the, in some ways, in terms of a true breakout company, the independent breakout company from that era, you know, they, I think they came in maybe six months after we did. And we could, mm -hmm. you know, we were all looking at one another and, you know, from the user experience and workflow perspective, they had the, the foundation of Spark, which was, you know, in some ways quite different. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, so, so you ended up uh, leaving Cloudera and... Um, essentially you decided that you wanted to start a new company. And I think this takes us more forward in sort of the modern um, world and, and how you saw the data stack emerging. So I'm curious, like, what were you seeing um, at, at the time before you started Continual? And what was it that inspired you and motivated you? What was the key insight that led you to start Continual? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, 
so yeah, I was at Cloudera for three years, had a great time there, you know, you know, loved my time there, met tons of great people, you know, the product was successful. So it, was, it ended up being a very uh, happy journey for myself and I think for the product as well. Um, in the, you know, sort of in the last year, I would say, particularly at Cloudera, which was, you know, in sort of the two, uh, you know, two years ago, um, the number one, you know, I was, I was in the role of sort of CTO for ML, which kind of had a little bit of an outbound role, a little bit of technical leadership internal to the team. We had formed a business unit and whatnot. Um, and, you know, in talking with all these companies, the number one thing I heard again and again and again was how do I get all my models into production? How do I operationalize them? Uh, and that was the big struggle, right? They had built data science teams. They had bought a data platform. They had gotten their data together. They had done some R&D sort of projects, but they were all struggling to operationalize and productionize more than one model, right? They might get one model into production. If it was a little static model, they might throw it over the fence and it's now it's on an API and they got a flask endpoint. They maybe load balanced it with Kubernetes or something like that. But they didn't really, they all had visions of we are going to be an AI first enterprise, right? They had bought in all the company. I didn't need to go and show them my slide on, you know, why the future is going to be AI first and every leading company is going to embed, you know, AI across their business, right? I had those slides, but often they would show me those slides, right? They would show me, they were, you know, if you talk to banks, if you talk to pharma, if you talk to telecom, um, if you, especially at the big companies, right, where billions of dollars are throwing, flowing through those businesses, there is just everywhere, you, you know, there's opportunities to, to do predictions and to have millions of dollars in return, right? At smaller scale companies, it's going to be a little bit of a harder because the, the returns often are maybe at the same percentage basis, but the absolute basis doesn't justify if the complexity is high, doesn't justify it. But there was a, you know, there was total belief that there were hundreds and hundreds of applications for them to do, um, but they weren't, you know, really seeing necessarily all the ROI and their di own diagnosis of that problem was, Hey, we're really struggling to get to production. So that was the number one thing. Hey, we, and that's not a unique insight, right? In some ways, like, you know, the whole rise of ML ops as a, as a kind of category and a, mm -hmm. and a theme, mm -hmm. you know, is, is it, people widely understand that this, you know, it's kind of almost a cliche, like, you know, well, X percent of models don't get to production. You know, you get kind of mocked if you kind of say, say that, but it's true. I mean, it's true in the sense that you know, people are not embedding AI across their business at the velocity that they would like, right? And I, and particularly in the companies that I talked to at Cloudera, which are not Silicon Valley tech companies, they're mainstream, you know, Fortune mm -hmm. 2000, right? Global businesses that are, you know, that are, that are sophisticated, but also, uh, you know, you know, practical, right? Their core business is not necessarily technology. Um, there was a lot of uh, challenge there. And then I looked at the solutions that you know we were offering at Cloudera, but also just the, the marketplace was offering, even the you know the public clouds, to that problem that I was mm -hmm. hearing again and again. And what we would show is a stack diagram that would, had seven different distributed systems inside of it, right? So if you look at you know the Uber Michael you know Michelangelo platform from Uber, which has been blogged about, and it's kind of like a nice little reference uh, platform. You know, if you look at that thing and you actually look at every box there, there's seven or eight different distributed systems. There's so stream process. So, yeah, you yeah. realize this, this is bigger than just um, model serving. Like it's this is not just a model serving problem. It's bigger than that. Yeah, this is not a model. This is not putting a model in a container, right? You know, on one hand, you have these toy solutions. You know, I would call them kind of toy data science platforms, which are saying, oh, I can wrap a model in an API, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and put it in as a Flask app and put it under Kubernetes. And oh, I have you know, I've solved some big problem. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, we, we already know how to do that. I mean, SREs know how to do that. I mean, there's little things around monitoring, you know, data drift and whatnot. That's not the hard problem. The hard problem is the continual nature of mo most enterprise machine learning applications where data is continually coming in. The world is continually changing. I need to store my historical data for training purposes. I need current data for you know, current inference purposes, whether that's real time or whether that's batch. My model has to be updated, not every hour, but I mean, it has to be updated every on some basis. So the model is now living. The model is being trained regularly. You know, uh, the, the inference is being done. Uh, the whole thing needs to be monitored. And so what you end up having is, you know, you have, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're in Cloudera, you have, you know, a, you know, historical HDFS and, a, you know, H, whatever, HBase for historical stuff. You have Spark and stream processing for data engineering. You have, you know, we have all the bits, but the complexity is, is, uh, is, is high, is high. And the clouds, you know, some people think, oh, well, that's a, you know, that bit, that's the problem with Hadoop or something. No, I mean, that's just the problem with every stack diagram that I've seen out there. If you go and you look at, what SageMaker shows you, or you look at what, uh, you know, Vertex AI from Google show you, um, you know, if you actually care about the continual ML operations aspect, right? Mm -hmm. Not just like, hey, I want to train a notebook or I want to train a job. 
but I want this thing to be humming along, right? People's public perception of, of AI is that this thing is learning, right? It's getting better mm -hmm. and better and better. And if you want it, if you want that, if you want that for your company and you want to have not just one or two models, but you want to have dozens of models, then you end up with this incredibly complicated system. And, uh, you know, that's uh, frustrating. It doesn't seem necessary to me. So, I mean, I, you know, you know, I think there's, I think there's a solution to that, uh, you know, or um, that doesn't just involve, you know, you know, pipeline jungles and everything. I think we need to come up with a much higher level of abstraction to think about operational AI, which is what continual is about, uh, is really finding a, a higher level of abstraction to, you know, 10x simplify the time to build models, you know, 10x, you know, reduce the cost to maintain them, you know, 10x, uh, you know, increase the velocity and ease of improving the model. So it tends to be these three phases, right? You need to, for operate, for production models, you need to you build them, right? And once you build one, you build a churn model, you typically build a churn model for 30 days, for 60 days, for 90 days, for, you know, net expansion, net contraction, product upsell. So quickly, if it becomes easy to build these models, you know, you want a lot of them. And then, so you, so you want that process to be fast where you can reuse your work. And, and then second, hey, if your model's in production, don't, you definitely don't wanna be tied down with a maintenance crisis or a maintainability cost. So you want it to be really easy to maintain, which is very hard in these pipeline jungle you know, mm -hmm. kind of situations. Mm -hmm. You know, you offboard team members, you onboard team members, and then you want it, then you iterate, right? You have new features, you in, import a new data source, you have new signals, the model decays in some way. So you need to change, you know, change the, the inputs to it. Probably not the model architecture, honestly, um, like that probably don't need to change or maybe change it kind of independently. Um, so you want also want to have it be, be fast to iterate. So continual is really about that. And I, I, I mean, I, I can go into more of that. So, wants, so, so I get the, I get this notion that you wanted to um, create a higher level abstraction that um, covered a lot of similar things in, in your um, example of this, this Michelangelo reference architecture. Um, so you felt like some of those things had to be sort of um, abstracted away and made simpler to use for, for modern, um, modern enterprises. Um, you also mentioned an interesting term that I want to dig into a little bit more, which is operational AI. Um, so how do you think of operational AI as being different than other kinds of AI? Can you just sort of walk us through like what your mental model is for thinking about like what is operational AI and how do you define that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, no, I think there's one domain of AI, which is, I, I would call it research, right? Which is, you know, where you're, where you're you know, you're essentially trying to, you know, just experiment with models and, you know, build models, but essentially you have a research style workflow, right? In that world, what you want is you want notebooks, you want, you know, collaboration features, you want experiment tracking, right? So the weights and biases of the world, right? You want to be able to, as a researcher, maybe you want, you know, a training platform or grid or, you know, a determined or something like that that gives you, or, you know, whatever the sage maker equivalents, but you're, gonna, you're basically going to train models. You're going to explore things in a notebook, and you need a, a product, you need to track your experiments so that you have some, you can keep track of what's working and what, what's not. But it's kind of an R and D, it's very similar to what goes on in, in mm. a research lab, right? Mm. And I would say a lot of the early platforms out there for data science, we're, we're solving that. They started with mm. notebooks, right? Then they added experiment tracking, right? You know, you could collaborate, you could, you know, you're gonna do work with the team. So you could, you know, you're gonna get access to compute resources. So how can I get access to a GPU? You know, that's gonna be, so that's the cloud, right? Maybe they should live in the cloud. But there were, there were platforms really that were geared towards R R and D. Um, I would say there's one level like up from that, which is you know you're doing R and D, and then you take a little serialized model and you stick it somewhere, you stick it in a container, mm. you stick mm. it on a on a phone, right? It can recognize an image, you know, it can do something. But you don't have a. It's not a process where you know the data is continually changing, the changing training data is continually ch uh, changing. There's features that are kind of coming in from some complicated mm. backend systems. Uh, it doesn't have that, right? It's basically you pass an image in, you get a classification out, right? Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. a world that kind of can live in that. The workflow can be R and D oriented. Pass over that model, you know, maybe mm -hmm. you train it, retrain it every six months or something. To, it's relatively to static. Yeah. It's relatively static. So for me, the operational AI, you know, where what uh, is really where the data uh, and the model are continually changing, uh, continually changing. So one, the model needs to be regularly retrained, right? Even if it's every month, right? It's, it's something that, hey, I need to automate this process. This is a process that needs to be highly automated. Um, and secondarily, and actually almost more importantly, the data is changing, right? So not only the training data, but also the feature data and there's feature pipelines coming in. Um, and then once you start building that whole system, right, where you have, feature engineering loops, you have training loops, you know, you deployments and promotions, 
monitoring and visibility across of that. That's where you know you get into like machine learning operations, or mm -hmm. you know, I would say even continual machine learning operations, mm -hmm. uh, or you know, or operational AI. That that's where you know I would that's what I view as operational AI. Mm -hmm. um, Got it. The second part Got of it. that it's it affects the business. <laughs> so so I mean that's mm -hmm. the, that's the second part. That, yeah, well let's let, that, let's yeah. talk about that. So like what what are some use cases where um, you think this is particularly meaningful in business? Um, well, they're all over. So, I mean, there's, there's the obvious ones, right? Like, uh, you know, sales and marketing related, you know, churn and, 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 you know, the customer LTV and things like that, which you just, you know, as a, as a, especially within a large business with, you know, or B2C business where you have lots of customers, you really need to have those, you know, those metrics. You need, to, you need to fight churn by knowing who's going to churn. You need to personalize your marketing uh, by figuring out what people are going to, you know, respond to. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a whole, you know, there's a class of use cases in, in sort of the sales and operations space. There's a class of use cases in the backend business operations. So things like supply chain, right? What are my inventory? Um, a lot of forecasting use cases uh, in those domains. Um, and then I would say, you know, I think one of the, the things that I've definitely learned about ML is there is a tremendous long tail of use cases. So when you go into a, any company uh, and you start talking to them about their data. I mean, they just go, I mean, it, you know, it's like, I have a bot that's going through a pipeline, an oil pipeline and it's taking pictures, right? And it's, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, if the bolts are loose or something that on the connection joint so I can do mm -hmm. maintenance, right? Mm -hmm. Or I, you know, I remember talking to a company that was, you know, they were trying to track, you know, steel beams and they wanted to use RFID tags but the beams were so hot because they were coming out of a, a you know, a, a steel mill. And so they had to put a paint on them and then they needed a camera to take the picture of the, 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 the number. And, you know, and it, you know, it's not, not, those are things that I would, you know, would not think about, right? Um, there's also, you know, tremendous, you know, in the, in, in the, with the rise of NLP and uh, text processing and, and what we can do now with text, mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. tremendous number of applications where we're trying to, there's continually, continual information coming in from text and, and whether it's business support processes, messages and support yeah. messages and whatnot, how do you mm -hmm. get those insights out, you know, immediately detect trends, you know, figure out bugs, you know, the trend, trends and bugs, uh, customer satisfaction rates, um, auto, you know, auto categorization, I mean, just long, long, long tail. And in almost all of those cases, you know, hey, you have a system that's can, right, customer behavior is changing, the world is changing, COVID hits, right? If you, if you really want to scale it, so you're not just stuck maintaining by hand one use case, you've got to build this highly automated system, right? Where you can do one use case, let it go on autopilot, move on to the next use case. And if you don't, you're going to kind of, you know, plateau out there and uh, not be able to kind of really scale the, the ML use cases to the degree that you might want, which I've seen, so you, you know, again and again. So, so your, your argument is that um, modern businesses are just ill-equipped to handle the complexity of this kind of constant continual, if you will, um, updating of their AI models, their training data, the features, the signal, and, um, and, and the types of tools that we had before were, were much more sort of almost like batch insights oriented. And um, they're just not suitable or not suited to the creation of this kind of continuous learning process um, in the modern data world. Yeah, well, I, well, yeah, I, exactly. I mean, I think we're still stuck in that world. I mean, I think, you know, I don't, you know, there's tremendous excitement around ML ops, but I, I mean, for me, having just spent eight years doing that and, you know, in, you know, from my previous and, and then kind of getting more and more towards production, like I am not satisfied with the status quo of where things are headed. Like, I don't think mm -hmm. people should be satisfied. Like a, a Kubernetes platform and a job system and a monitoring tool and all of that stuff. I mean, is it really necessary, you know, for, for most applications when you contrast it, where you know you obviously know that you're there's these if you don't have to bring your data to bear right you can use these APIs these serverless things right if you don't have your own data and you're going to do speech rec recognition or you're going to do you know now an increasing number like GPT three you know you can do a lot of applications without your data that mm -hmm. is just so simple I mean it's hundred mm -hmm. x simpler than that what I was describing mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. now there's what, what I perceive is there's this missing thing how do we bring a higher level abstraction you know dramatically simpler but still allow you to use your own data, right? Which is most many, many, many use cases mm -hmm. need you to use your own data, right? So it's your supply chain, your customers, your support cases, your, you know, your, your cameras from your pipelines. That's all, you know, you're not going to do that through GPT-3, right? You got to bring that data to bear, to bear on that. And, right? and inc data. increasingly, increasingly that data is sitting in, um, you know, far more mature um, data warehouses, at least more mature than when you, started you know in the industry yeah. um, years ago so so now we find that 
um, that data is landing in Redshift or BigQuery or Snowflake. Um, so then how does continual sort of fit into the modern data stack? Because I know you have, you have thoughts on this as well. You're, you're talking about yeah, the power yeah, of a yeah. customer bringing their own data, um, you know, to a more uh, sort of a more nuanced um, continuous learning system. So t- take us to the next step. I'm, I'm sort of dying to, to hear like, like, <laughs> Wait, how, how continual I'm, fits I'm in. I'm ranting here about the, the pro, like, hey, we shouldn't be satisfied, <laughs> I think. Uh, but, you know, what, what's the solution? And it's not just us. There's, I can also talk about what other, I think there are some things coming out of the academic world, um, you know, that are, that are worth, that are interesting around this, around, well, potential solutions. This. I mean, there's another, just, I mean, to, to pause on that, because you mentioned data warehouses. I think actually another analogy is, is the sort of the SQL analogy. You know, if, if every time you wanted to do a model, like or a, like a like an analytical model, right? You just mm-hmm. wanted to do some reporting, a BI use case. If you had to write MapReduce, right? You know that used to be like on Hadoop. That was the that was the state, right? You had to mm-hmm. write if you wanted if you wanted to do an analytical question, how many active users do I have using this complicated mm-hmm. definition of active on a large amount of data where you needed to do it in Hadoop? You had mm-hmm. to write MapReduce jobs. And then it's okay. That that's fine. You can do it. It's very powerful. But oh my gosh, the the productivity challenge of that. You know how slow it is to 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 to, to build that use case, maintain that use case, and then got, and then iterate on it, improve it. Hey, I'm changing my definition, or I'm adding another. So I think there's the same. We're in the same. We're in like the map reduce world for ML is, is my feeling, right? Like that's that's the stage we're at. It's we're we're so excited about big data. It's amazing. Just now we're so excited about AI. But we're kind of at the level of abstraction that MapReduce, you know, the, uh, you know, was back then, right? And and we need that SQL. We need that. What is the SQL for AI? And it, you know, might be related to SQL. Might be not quite exactly, you know, related to SQL. But it needs to be that, you know, higher level abstraction. And it needs to be operational because that affects the business. So, you know, that gets to the, you know, to your question is how does continual, you know, the, or the trend I think that you you pointed out. Um, if you want to build a higher level abstraction, you need to think about where is the right place to plug into, right? Mm-hmm. Fundamentally, AI and ML is driven by data. Um, and so you obviously need to, where am I going to get the data, right? And how am I going to expose my predictions back? And I think one of the, you know, when I was leaving Cloudera, we were, you know, I was convinced, oh, this is, not, I'm not satisfied with where the status quo is going, but there was kind of a question, well, okay, where, where, where do you kind of fit in, right, um, here? And I think what I what you know what I also have seen I think when everybody's seen this over the last couple of years is the data warehouse or namely SQL oriented interfaces to data that are cloud native. So I would say you know that could be Lakehouse or Data Warehouse, but it's basically structured data, relational, temporal data sitting accessible via SQL in an elastic you know cloud data environment. Things like Redshift, Snowflake, right? Snowflake obviously is a you know a huge you know probably the number one you know example of this. Databricks with their Delta Lake. Um, you know, BigQuery, uh, that's where data is moving to. And in, even, even you know, e, you know, customer data, supply chain data, e, even, you know, unstructured data, right? So if you have images of satellites from across the world, like, hey, it should be pretty nice to be able to query like the metadata associated with those images, right? Mm-hmm. And you say, okay, which images have cars in them or which images, you know, how many, you know, what, is this night or day or whatever it is you want, you know, put it in a structured environment. It's so powerful. Um, and it's, and this, and SQL, has, you know, gives you this dramatically easier uh, workflow, especially when things get big, right? Because big means complex, you know, if you don't, right? If you're on your laptop and notebook, that's fine. So the one thing, so what, what Continual does is we're trying to build really an operational ML platform or AI platform that sits on top of your data warehouse, that sits on top of your structured data environment so that we're not doing the data integration. Your data integration is happening in the data warehouse. And the question is now, okay, well, if you want something that's as easy as SQL, um, but also operational, what is that platform that you put on top or what is that box that you put on top? And, you know, we're, we're seeing that in other parts of this modern data stack that, you know, the modern data stack, you know, that, you know, I would call it as, you know, data warehouse centric, right? The data warehouse lives in the center. You get an emerging ecosystem of tools that play well together around it. Now, those can be ingestion tools like Fivetran, Airbyte, et cetera. They can be BI tools, of course, uh, transformation tools like DBT, uh, reverse ETL tools, like how do you bring data out of that into your SaaS applications? And then the question is, well, what about AI and ML? How do I, do, if I, if I want to do customer mm-hmm. churn, I want that to be maintained. How do I do that? If I want to do inventory forecast, how do I do that? Uh, and so continual, we're, you know, we're building an AI platform, you know, that has, that's declarative, uh, that has this much higher level of ab- abstraction that's operational and that's, you know, native to the data warehouse. Native to the data warehouse, why? Because by being opinionated about that, you know, we can 
it becomes much easier. It becomes, op we can get access to your data. We can put data back if we want to, namely the predictions uh, and your whole set of tools all play well together, right? So we mm -hmm. don't have to take over the whole world. We just have to give you, you know, 10 X simpler AI and ML uh, in, a, in an ecosystem that works with, you know, works well with you. So it's like, it's like the AI brain that sits on top of your, your data warehouse, essentially. Um, yeah, so no, I, I, uh, yeah, no, internally, we always, it's always like the balance when doing startup between marketing uh, and, uh, you know, and, and reality, especially around AI and ML. But I think conceptually, that idea of a brain is what people want. You know, you want, uh, you know, you want, if you, if you believe your, your, your business is going to be AI first, you want to look at something in your business and saying, hey, this thing, this is the thing that's learning, that has all the signals that I'm bringing all the signals to bear on, that I have all my predictions. And so, yeah, so we are, you know, we think of it like building the brain, you know, the aspirational vision for what we're trying to do is we're trying to build the brain for, for businesses. Um, and mm -hmm. we're trying to do, and we're doing that in a way that sits on top of the data platform for business, which is the modern data stack cloud data warehouses. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, so, so I, I'm curious to go sort of a, a level deeper into the, the design decisions and the architecture um, of Continual. Um, what are the core architectural components of the system that you're working with? Um, let me think about that one. Uh, so, um, I mean, maybe there's, maybe there's three, three core ones. Uh, let's see if I can remember. So, so the first one is declarative. Um, and um, by, by that, I mean, you know, we're, we're trying to take most ML platforms out there are sort of are kind of code first and pipeline first and notebook first. You know, they basically are about sort of stitching together pipe, you know, Python uh, scripts and steps and training steps and all that sort of stuff. You know, uh, TensorFlow TFS X is maybe the example of like an end, end to end version of that. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to raise the level of abstraction where you have a workflow that's really data centric. So you are organizing your features and your signals how do those relate? You know, what are the features that you have on your customers, on your products, on the core entities of your business? And what are the so that's, targets? That's like a yeah. feature store. So is that a feature store component of the architecture? Yeah, exactly. It's a feature store component, but we're doing it on the, on the, the second kind of the design choice is to be data warehouse centric. So we're, we're not trying to replicate that data into our environment and build a feature store cache kind of thing. What we're trying to do is we're, we're giving you a, a, a feature store we're also giving you a, you know, there one, one aspect is features. The other one aspect is your targets. So exactly. So one part of what we're doing is a feature store that's data warehouse centric, mm -hmm. right? And that gives mm -hmm. you a, a workflow where you can organize and share your features across all your use cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and we carefully take care of the relational aspects and the temporal aspects, right? So what was mm -hmm. the feature at a point in time? But again, we do that in the data warehouse. So we make sure that that mm -hmm. uh, exists in the data warehouse. But the second one is we, we give you the workflow, and that's SQL, you know, it's the, those features are defined with SQL because it's a data warehouse. Mm. Uh, you know, we have the same thing we do with, with respect to your targets. So what are the targets that you have, you, you know, and what are you trying to predict, right? What is your definition of churn? You might have three or four different definitions of churn. At that point, you know, our belief when I say declarative AI is you've basically done everything that's necessary, that you need to bring your business knowledge and domain expertise to, right? It's what are the signals? What are the targets? That's, I can't automatically, automatically do. I need you to bring your business domain expertise. The rest, the pipelines, the retraining, the monitoring, the drift detection, all of that, it's all, it's all stuff that you should not have to think about. An ideal system, whenever that arrives, should not have to do that. You might need to do a little additional policy. For instance, do you want automatic promotions of your models or do you want to take a look at them first? You know, do you want to retrain them weekly or nightly? Uh, you know, things like that, that's all, you know, how much money do you want to spend for a good model, right? So there's a little bit of what I would call policy. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that to me is the level of uh, the level of complexity that's necessary, but everything else is unnecessary. So, but so you're wrapping, design... you're wrapping all of these um, sort of services that in, in some systems, again, sort of back to the Michelangelo example, because I think that's a good one. Um, you're wrapping a lot of these services up into one into one platform. So when you talk about um, uh, you know feature store like stuff, um, you're talking about I'm sure some kind of model management, um, whether using AutoML or something that's defined by the customer. Um, there's monitoring. There's sort of all the necessary pieces that um, sort of best of breed or or um, build your own systems basically, you know, have components for along the value chain, um, you're sort of wrapping that up into one 
um, piece with this key abstraction. I want to talk about this a little bit more too. You talk a lot about declarative AI and I think we should talk about that next. But I just want to first understand, like um, make yeah. sure I'm grasping sort of what the architectural components are that you are, are putting into this platform. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I think we got there. Well, yeah, I mean, so so in, on one hand, you know, behind the scenes, of course, there is a pipeline that's training a model and there's a, there's the model is being versioned somewhere and whatnot. Um, that is true, but we are, and so in one hand, we're, you know, end to end in the, in, the, in the sense that we're trying to get you to the end value. Namely, you have predictions mm -hmm. that are getting better and better and better, you know, that, and, and we do everything that's necessary to do that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if I, you know, the term end to end in the ML space, you know, typically you have all these nouns on the side, you have your jobs, you have all these things, you have your notebooks, you have all these things, uh, you know, in an end to end ML platform, you try to cram it all together. And then you kind of, and that's all the, you know, SageMaker is, is like that. We are, you know, we, all of that, all of those internal things, jobs, it all is behind the scenes, right? It so it away. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's like SQL. I mean, you don't, in a, in a database, right? You're not going and seeing, I mean, unless you go deep into some debugging UI, you're not actually seeing, you know, what's happening. You're just writing a SQL query. And mm -hmm. we think the exact same way. You should just write your features, your targets, a little tiny bit of configuration. Everything else should be on autopilot. And you shouldn't even, and, and it really needs to be a, a, a non-leaky abstraction. If you do this well, you got to make that non-leaky like SQL, right? So it, it's, you know, you don't, uh, otherwise, you know, you end up kind of in the, in the complexity world. And so if there's, and I think there's, you know, the question is, can it be pulled off? You know, there's skeptics out there. Uh, you know, I think, I think even myself, I was a code first data scientist. Can you, can you raise the level of abstraction? One, I think we got to try, right? Uh, you know, because the current status quo can't be the end of the of end of the line of innovation. Um, and the second one I would say is, I'm, we're, there, there's increasing evidence that this is going to happen. Um, you know, there's a great paper actually out by Chris uh, Ray and uh, Piero Molino. So that's uh, from Stanford, the Snorkel Project and the Ludwig Project. Um, basically, Apple has this de you know, declarative AI system called Overton. Uber has this one called Ludwig. They just wrote a, a paper on declarative ML systems. And I think it's increasingly recognized, even in sort of the leading research area, that there is going to be what you could think of as a third wave ML platform that is declarative at the core, right? The first mm -hmm. wave I would say was collaboration and R&D oriented. The second wave was ML ops in its traditional Kubernetes pipeline kind of centric way that every, there's about 50 versions of that you know, today. And I, I was a one version of that uh, in my previous startup. And I think there's a future which is you know, declarative, right? Data first, declarative, uh, you know, kind of raises the level of abstraction. I think that's where we ultimately will have to get. It's gonna broaden the access to ML. It's gonna allow it to really you know, become ultimately pervasive. Um, and I think if somebody pulls that off and, you know, I can feel, you know, I can see what we're doing internally that it's going to happen, uh, you know, then it's, it's going to be quite disruptive. Um, you know, maybe first for people that, you know, are, uh, you know, don't have any alternative, right? They can't go down that complicated code first path, right? The data team that, that you know, is more analytics oriented. Um, but ultimately I think it's going to, it will spread. Well, I like how you used the, the SQL example because, um, you know, as, as a reminder um, to all of us, um, sort of the original, the original declarative language, um, maybe not the original one, but seems like the most ubiquitous one is SQL. And um, I think in, in the same way that SQL sort of abstracts, um, you know, all of the, 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 the machinery and performance and um, analytics and optimization and all the things around sort of running that query and, and delivering you the results that you're looking for, it seems to me like this is your notion of, of quote, operational or declarative, sorry, uh, the declarative AI in the sense that, um, you know, th this type of model could be used for, um, to, to tease insights and to generate insights from a complicated AI system. And that, that's what you're going for. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's exactly, exactly right. I mean, I think SQL is probably the, the most obvious sort of analogy. I think, you know, for people that are, you know, infrastructure people, you know, another analogy that often resonates with them is the infrastructure as code, sort of the Terraform and the Kubernetes mm. declarative cloud infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Clearly, we do not write imperative scripts anymore to manage our infrastructure, to bring them up, to upgrade them, to fix them when they've gone down. We say, hey, we have auto scaling groups that I want this many replicas. And if things go back, something should correct it and make it another, you know, another, bring up another pod or another virtual machine. And you and you have a and you have a whole workflow that results from that, right? 
you, you know, you, you have, you know, maybe you'll use version, you version control that configuration. You do change management on it, right? And you can bring up dev stacks and prod stacks and all this stuff. And so that core, it's a declarative language, right? And so there, that, there's, the, there's a similar, I think the operational aspect, the analytical aspect is kind of probably has a more SQL flavor to it. The operational aspect has a more Terraform flavor to it. Because I would say there's, there's a danger, you know, the problem is operational ML and the complexity around that. It's not just, you know, calling scikit-learn fit. Oh, is that too complicated? And I need to do that in SQL, right? Scikit-learn, you know, you can already pretty easily just train a model in, in, in Python. It's not like an amazing accomplishment to put that into SQL and now you have BigQuery ML and you've, you know, you have a, you can write a SQL query that generates a model. It's the whole continual ML operations aspect of it. And so that's really, you know, some people, you know, look at what we're doing at continual. Like, oh, are you building like a BigQuery ML or a Redshift ML? No, no, we're building an operational oriented platform. It's, op, you mm -hmm. know, that's, everything we're doing is operational, right? Like there's no, there's no model that is an exploit, like a, like an R and D model. Every model that's in our system is like a, a living, breathing model that's going to continually be maintained and improve and improve. And I think you want ML systems that are designed with that operation. You know, you need to start from that operational mindset um, because that's the ultimate problem that you're trying to, that, you know, the problem and it's the, the value that you, um, that you want to deliver. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's an exciting vision. And um, I can't wait to see the the product and the company continue to, to develop. Um, you have, yeah, it's you have always, some... It's, so some great it's ideas there. See it to believe it. It's always a see it, see it to believe it. I think it's one of those yeah. things where when you talk about it, you know, uh, so, you know, we're, we're in, we're in early access now. You can, you know, go to continual AI and you can, you know, sign up and, you know, we'll, we'll let you on. It, it exists. So we'll let you, we'll let you on. Um, uh, and we'd love, you know, we'd love to work with people on, on use cases, but I think it, yeah, awesome. we're, we're super excited to, to, to like, just, you know, give more concrete talks, actually give a demo of this. Cause I think that's when the, the rubber hits the road and people will see, see the potential. You know, you can also, I would, I would encourage people to go read papers like the Overton paper, you know, the Ludwig paper, this declarative mm. ML systems paper. There's, mm. you know, there's, uh, you know, if you're skeptical um, about, you know, can we actually find a higher level abstraction? Um, I think the answer is increasingly yes, we can. And mm -hmm. let's, let's have more people work on it, right? Not, let's like mm -hmm. not have more pipeline systems and notebook systems and whatever. I mean, we can work on those two. Those are important, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. like, let's try to push the envelope a little further. Yeah, well, th thanks for those insights and those paper references. Um, I'm sure people will take your advice and um, and and you know bone up a bit more on the on the uh, declarative ML stuff. Um, so before we let you go, since you've spent so many years um, building data tooling, um, you know, across sort of different dispensations of of, of the modern data ecosystem, I'm curious, um, what surprised you most about your work in data so far? Mm -hmm. Um, probably, uh, I mean, I mean, honestly, especially with these recent IPOs, probably scale, uh, the value of production and mm. the scale of production. Um, so I actually got it, you know, what I mean, but, you know, I mean, I would say like, you know, the, the success of Databricks and Snowflake, for instance, you know, it, it's, some, it's amazing how big those businesses are. Uh, and it's because of the production aspect, the scale of the data that they allow you to process and the fact that it's in production. Um, and one of the things, I mean, I, I learned at, at Sense, I, the previous company was, we had two features. We had a notebook based feature, which was collaboration around notebooks. And we had a kind of a, a job system, which was really an afterthought to, to help you productionize, you know, schedule a job or a notebook that would get run again and again. And what we saw was, wow, the jobs in terms of usage and in terms of usage and business impact, the jobs were killer because the, the notebooks, you have seven data scientists, they come onto the platform, they open seven notebooks. You know, it's kind of, they have seven units of impact you know, on that given day, a job, a seven data scientists come in, they build seven new jobs, right? They have seven additional units of impact today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day. And from a usage perspective, it also goes up, right? The, the data gets bigger and the, and so, so you end up having, you know, from a business perspective, uh, you know, from a, as a vendor, you know, the usage goes up and it's amazing how big, you know, businesses, the world economy is and how global it is. And, you know, and so it's really that, I think the biggest surprise is just how large, um, you know, production is within these companies. Um, I mean, the second, I would say surprising thing, which it continues to surprise me is just this long, which I mentioned earlier, is this long tail of applications. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, people always throw out, oh, churn or something like that. You know, and it gets a little bit, you know, okay, we, we've all heard you can do churn modeling with, with ML. But, you know, when you actually go and start talking to customers in depth, it's really fun because they bring all of their little unique uh, ideas and, and, and applications. And, 
it just, it just, you know, even within something like sales and marketing, which you think would be relatively, you know, kind of canonical, you know, yes, mm -hmm. there's a whole set mm -hmm. of canonical problems, but there's a whole set of other ones, unique data, unique op op opportunities. And so that does make, um, you know, ML, you know, exciting. It also is, shows you the challenge of a vertical, you know, platform, right? So I think the, the, like there are tools that are, you know, trying to build vertical, you know, some people think everything's going to get verticalized. Um, and I think just like VI, um, there is always going to be a need for a horizontal platform, right? Where you you can bring all your own data to, to, to bear uh, and not everything is going to get vertical, verticalized um, mm -hmm. uh, as a result of that. But well, I, I think those um, are we, surprising. We, we, th yeah, thanks for that. Um, we did get a question, a couple of questions in the chat uh, that I just wanted to, um, to mention to you before we sign off. Um, and this is going to take you back to sort of the, your, your, your mental um, frame of mind for continual and how you're thinking about the company. Um, Jeremy's asking, um, who's the target buyer and user persona for the product is the first question. And two, as a customer, what does it take to get up and running reaching the first instance of value? Um, so how quickly does yeah. the customer sort of feel value from the system? Um, so if, if, if you're able to weigh in on those, that would be great. Yeah, so so the ideal customer for us is is really a, like a data team or an analytics team. Uh, I think that's the initial market where they really don't have a great solution, right? They don't want to build up a whole kind of Kubernetes-based ML platform, particularly for a you know, let's say they're doing inventory, you know, and some operational forecasting problem, or or they're a marketing and sales organization and they're trying to do a you know, they've adopted the modern data stack, right? They have the the, the standard stack there. Now they want to go beyond analytics. They have their churn in the last 30 days. They want to do the churn in the next 30 days or the customer's most likely to churn. You know, we really allow them to pull that off, right? A team that doesn't maybe is not sort of as sophisticated or often they actually are pretty sophisticated, but they really don't have the time or the resources to, to maintain a like a full ML platform team and all of that. That's our initial, our initial thing. Now, my belief is that declarative AI is the future, period. I mean, that is my belief. Um, uh, so, you know, and I think it's going to, I think once you experience the time to value and once the platforms mature, you know, it's going to, there's going to be more and more and more use cases where you're just going to want to do it. And uh, the ML platforms, kind of the engineering oriented platforms are going to be left to very, very core ML, like absolutely mission critical fraud, you know, detection systems uh, that are low latency streaming, that are highly integrated with the rest of the engineering platform that, that you already have. So that will always exist. I'm, we're not trying to replace that, um, like, you know, completely replace that. But I think more and more use cases, just, you know, as you start to use APIs that are, you know, don't even require data to do things, um, more and more use cases will move towards a declarative uh, approach. So, so, um, so I would say, yeah, starting with the, you know, analytics and data teams, um, kind of, you know, data scientists, machine learning research engineers, you know, are gonna be doing their own thing for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of time to value, uh, I mean, minutes. Right, that's the magic, and I mean minutes like not just minutes on training a training model. I mean minutes on a model that is in production that is getting better and better, uh, and and the and that's the beautiful thing about the two two sort of design choices we made. One is to bet on the data warehouse. All you need to do is give us those credentials. We'll take over a schema. We'll start managing your features and your predictions there, and so we don't have any of the data integration challenges that that most mm -hmm. ML platforms mm -hmm. have. Data and. Your data is already there. You already have a workflow using DBT to clean it up, to do some feature en advanced feature engineering. Ingestion is already happening. You already have it hooked up to your BI tool. So not only do we get access to the data, but the predictions we make can also be impacting your business immediately via your reporting functionality, via your downstream en data engineering, via your reverse ETL into your SaaS applications. You know, um, So all of that happens. That's, this just, that, that's the turnkey impact, right? Uh, and then our workflow, our declarative workflow, means that, you know, minutes to, to, to get to your first use mm -hmm. case. And it gets easier mm -hmm. and easier. I mean, once you have all your features around your kind of core entities, it tends to be you're building, you know, a dozen models on your customers, right? Not just one. So you start to, okay, here are the things that I know about my customers. How active have they been in the last week? And you have that going back in time. Now you can build your upsell, cross-sell, you know, uh, churn, LTV, all of those models where in our system, you all only need to define your target. You don't even need to define your features anymore. We'll bring all that stuff in. Um, and so we, and, and then you, you know, you have this uh, kind of, uh, you know, very rapid workflow. And so I think that's the, you know, that's when I think about, oh, wow, I'd have to set up an airflow DAG and I'd train it and how to monitor it. And mm -hmm. I love the, I always love the power of code. I'm at the core. I love the power of code at one hand, but I'm also like, never again would I do that for that use case. And I think that's going to, you know, spread, you know, spread, spread out. Yeah. 
Yeah, that sounds uh, really powerful. And it's awesome to be able to give customers um, such a short time to value. So um, so that's great. Tristan, um, thanks for coming on and for, for sharing with us some of your inspiration. And, um, you know, you're obviously a very passionate guy and it's awesome, always awesome <laughs> to, to, hear, to hear your thoughts on the space. So, um, so thanks for joining us today. We all really appreciate it. Yeah, Pete, thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, and to the rest of our listeners, I just want to mention that our next event is on August 5th. We'll be having Anupam Dada, who's a co-founder of a company called Truera. And Anupam and I will be talking about uh, machine learning quality and monitoring uh, in that chat. So until next time, um, thanks for joining us. 